Gott, der geht auf. Dead or alive, it's hard times at the mill, my love. Hard times at the mill. Every morning just at six. Don't that old bell make you sick? It's hard times at the mill, my love. Hard times at the mill. Smashed me hand in the main shift drive. They said I was lucky to be alive. It's hard times at the mill, my love. Hard times at the mill. Ain't it enough to break your heart after work all day and at night it's dark? It's hard times at the mill, my love. Hard times at the mill. I'm at Style in Cheshire, and the mill you can see behind me is called Quarry Bank. It was built in 1784 by Samuel Gregg and powered by water. They were still spinning by water power here up until about 15 years ago. It's a fairly typical example of the new wave of factory building that followed the development of Arkwright's water frame. Now these mills had to be built where there was a good fall of water. They were often a long way from the nearest town of any size. And this created one very obvious problem. I wonder if it struck you. Where were the mill owners going to get the people to work the mills? They needed quite a few. This mill employed nearly 400 hands when it was in full production. They didn't all need to be skilled because the quality of the yarn depended on the machines. But they were needed to do things like mending broken threads, picking up the waste cotton that fell under the machines, cleaning the machines and so on. Where were they to come from? Well, there was one very convenient source, children from the poor houses of the towns. In those days, orphans and the children of people who couldn't support themselves were taken into poor houses, like Oliver Twist. Parish officials were bound by law to apprentice the children to a trade, and they were usually only too glad to get rid of them. Bidolf Vicarage, February the 24th, 1817. Dear Sir, the thought has occurred to me that some of the poor of this parish might be useful to you as apprentices in your factory at Quarrybank. If you are in want of any of the above, we could readily furnish you with ten or more from nine to twelve years of age of both sexes. Quarrybank Mill, February 27th, 1817. Dear Sir, I am much obliged by your attention and find we have room at present for about 12 young girls of from 10 to 12 years old. So one can imagine the coach loads and wagon loads of bewildered boys and girls rumbling slowly up the bumpy, muddy roads to the north, to these strange new factories in the hills of Derbyshire or Lancashire or Cheshire. After the long journey, the children must have had mixed feelings when they had their first sight of the mill. Few people had heard of factories in those days, let alone seen inside one. Soon after they arrived, the young apprentices might have had to go to the office of the mill to have their names and ages taken down for the records. This is where all the bookkeeping for the mill was done. Here the clerks sat at their ledgers, keeping the mill accounts. The office is very much as it was over a hundred years ago. It has an atmosphere of solid Victorian self-confidence. Everything is strong and substantial, built to last. And this is the boardroom where the mill owner, Samuel Gregg, must have sometimes sat at his desk, casting a critical eye over the books, perhaps 
asking his manager whether the apprentices were behaving themselves. One must realize, of course, that at that time it was perfectly normal for a child of working people to be expected to earn its keep from a very early age, about the age when present-day children go to infant school, about five. In the 1770s, a visitor from America watched a group of tiny children making wire cards for combing wool, and he commented that the work not only keeps their little minds free from vice, but takes a heavy burden from their poor parents. But the mill children were in the charge not of their parents, but of the mill owner. They were normally bound to him as apprentices until they were 21, which could mean for 10 years or more. The children here at Quarry Bank were lucky, for Mr. Greg was a conscientious master. We have an account of an apprentice called Joseph Sifton, who in 1806 ran away to London to see his mother. After he was caught, he was questioned by the magistrates, and his answers were taken down by a clerk. The rooms were very clean, the floors frequently washed. Our beds were good. We slept two in a bed and had clean sheets once a month and clean shirts every Sunday. On Monday we had for dinner milk and bread and sometimes thick porridge. We had always as much as we could eat. On Tuesday we had milk and potatoes. On Wednesday sometimes bacon and potatoes. Signed, Joseph Sifton. Well, that was pretty good treatment by 18th century standards. And Mr. Gregg's apprentices were visited regularly by a doctor and went to school on a Sunday and for a few hours during the week. They also went to church regularly. But there were other mills where things were very different. Robert Blinko, who was an apprentice at two Derbyshire mills, told of the governor walking the mill dining hall with a horsewhip of pale, haggard children, filthy and in rags, so hungry that they stole food from the pig's trough. Children who were used to being beaten until they were a mass of bruises, and having iron weights hung on their backs as a punishment. This may have been an extreme case, but it's clear that many apprentices were very badly treated, and that all worked very long hours. In Lytton, where Blinko was, they worked a 15-hour day. Here, in style, a day of 12 or 13 hours was normal. The water flowed all the time, and the manufacturers wanted to keep the machinery going as long as possible. Some manufacturers got very worried about the conditions of the apprentices. One was Sir Robert Peel. In 1802, he brought a bill before Parliament that limited their hours to 12 a day. That meant a 72-hour week, and banned night work and provided for inspection of the mills by a magistrate. But the magistrates tended to be friends of the mill owners, so often it didn't have any effect. An investigation in 1816 showed that in many mills, conditions were just as bad as ever. But in that same year, Parliament at last agreed that the system of sending poor children off to factories hundreds of miles from home was bad, and they passed a law that put a stop to it. But by now, there was another group of children to worry about. When steam mills came in, the factories could be built in the towns. There was no need for the pauper children, because to keep alive, thousands of parents had to send their own children to work in the mills. Their conditions were often just as bad as those of the pauper apprentices. But most manufacturers refused to accept the need for reform, 